Thank you for joining us. Wow. Oh, that's incredible. Isn't that gorgeous? Absolutely beautiful. <laughs> that's not something you see every day. Wow. Yeah, that, that's amazing. So as far as we know, are we the first people to, to lay eyes on this ship since it went down? To our knowledge. It looks directly in front of us. I think I can see oh, something. Oh, yeah. Still has the clapper in it yeah. and the mounting bracket. Look at that. Oh, my gosh. What was that, a yep. shell? I think that's a torpedo head. Yep. Yeah. I feel like that's even more reason not to touch it. Can you follow that angelfish that's with the yellow tail? Yep. Oh, my goodness. I haven't seen one this big before. They're so beautiful. <laughs> the other guy doesn't have spots. It's like a high rise, isn't it? It just keeps going yeah, and going. Yeah, shrimp skyscraper. <laughs> that is a sizable parrotfish. Yeah. I wonder how old these are. These are yeah, these massive. Are amazing. Pretty close to the seabed. Another uh, 15 minutes to go, 500 meters, whichever comes first. So far, so good. There's your tube. Or... There, this is alive here because I can see in through the tube and see the red plumes and of these guys as well. I don't know what all this woolly bit is, so this is new as far as I'm concerned. Right there looks good, Ed. Yeah, you got it. That's got it. Uh, front row yeah. signing off. Yeah, enjoy these images. We're going to be uh, just switching off the watch here, so stick with us. And uh, it's been great on the watch with you all, and we look forward to seeing what else comes about. So uh, see you soon. Whoa. Yeah, this one is called Sequoia because it's like a giant <laughs> oh, yeah. redwood. That's awesome. crazy. So, yeah, gosh. look at that. Whoa. Oh, oh, look at that. Look at that picture. Whoa. He just keeps going. So it's like a castle. Yeah. There's all the shrimp. Oh, wow. <laughs> Hanging out on that rock. You can see them really well with the brown staining. Oh, there's the top. The very tippy yeah. top. Oh, my gosh. It's just about 35 meters. Yeah. 35? Oh, it survived the quake. Oh, well, there's two of them. Yes. They, <laughs> they look so different, too. They're both mores, though. I love them. <laughs> I think they're a match made in heaven. I wonder what they think of us. Can I eat that thing out there? Oh, no. <laughs> Are we, like, interrupting Still a moment? The other one went back <laughs> in. Maybe it'll come Ooh, out this yeah. side again. <laughs> <laughs> we had a viewer say they're really romantic. Oh, like, uh, you know. oh thank double you. Double E. E? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Can you follow that angelfish? That looks like the endemic one that's found in the deep yellow crown oh, butterfly. Yeah. yeah. It's got that's so cool. The CNMI is trying to designate a state fish currently at oh. the moment, and these fish are actually on the ballot. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're endemic, so that's that's awesome. Yeah, We're exactly. Nice this year. Yeah. <laughs> that could be a good highlight. <laughs> this, this is a highlight. Uh, the main idea for this dive is to do a bunch of lava sampling. Mainly, we don't want them to have been sitting around in a hydrothermal vent, you know, because that changes the oh, mineralogy and the chemistry of the rocks. We want, we call it unaltered, more or less like it was when it erupted. Looks like that would be easy to sample. And then what we're going to grab here is the upper crust of this lobe. What is there stuff growing underneath it? Yeah. It looks like there's uh, things on the bottom side there, little things growing under there. A little like polyp some of us. Yeah. There's oh, oh. Da -da. This looks like we're in a fish tank. This is like we could just this is like a Disney movie. Some yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> oh, look this. at those bubble streams. This is wow. now are those CO two bubbles? That's CO two, yeah. This is amazing. Which is that look how much gas is coming out. Wow. Mm -hmm. Ten bananas. for ten with video with Ben again. That oh, is great. Oh my beautiful. gosh. Oh my what? Wow. I'm going to need some video clips of these. <laughs> <laughs> Eat your heart out, Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've seen champagne vents like in Colombo Crater. That was really pretty, oh, but nothing uh, was like this, like with the ambient light. I, I've never seen anything like that. Yeah. Like that pretty. So my name is Melissa Miller. I work at Scripps Institution of Oceanography as a staff research associate on the GoBGC and SOCOM flow programs. The Argo program is a much bigger program than just what we're working on. There's like 4,000 floats um, all around the global oceans. The floats that we're deploying are inside of these cardboard boxes. As you can see, we've got two left. We've already deployed four from EV Nautilus this week. So we deploy them inside their cardboard boxes. That keeps all the sensors and everything like that safe while we're lowering it over the side of the ship. And then we deploy the floats 
they will go into the ocean and they will go down to 2,000 meters deep, which is about a mile and a quarter, and then park themselves, basically. They have a buoyancy engine in them so they can go up and down in the water column. Slowly over the course of about seven hours, they come back up to the surface and all of their sensors are collecting data as they move their way through the water column. And then at the surface, they beam all that data back to us on land, and then they do that every 10 days. In the meantime, they stay at 1,000 meters depth, and that's where they drift for those 10 days. So we're never quite sure where they're gonna pop up. It might kind of stay in the same general area, or sometimes it catches a current and, you know, all the way across the Pacific. So this program is super important because it's a really efficient program. The robotic floats are doing work that people basically can't do. It's really important for us to have collaborators. We rely on ships of opportunity, which means that research vessels or other vessels who are already going out to sea take us along, take our floats and deploy them for us, or in this case, invite one of us to join the science party. So we were especially excited seeing Nautilus' season over here and really grateful to partner up with Ocean Exploration Trust for being on this transit. Incredible to see it come out of the dark like that. Wow. Yeah, this ship is the USS Vincennes. So USS Vincennes, along with uh, USS Astoria and USS Quincy, were patrolling this area when they came across uh, several Japanese uh, ships. And within about an hour later, USS Vincennes uh, sunk to the depth here, about a thousand meters, uh, taking with her um, about 300 of her crew. Uh, the battles of Guadalcanal and the Solomon Islands was the center stage of several really important naval battles. They, they all were taken in this very, very small geographic area between uh, really three major islands in this close body of water between the islands of Guadalcanal, Savo Island, and the Nagala Islands. It's an area that's about 30 square miles. Uh, we have about 100 or so naval ships that were lost uh, and about 1,500 planes. This expedition does include experts from all former combatant nations here in the Solomon Islands campaign. So certainly our goal is to showcase that international collaboration and each, each nation learning more about the history of this place and how it's changing over time. At this point, I feel we are definitely looking at the remains of the bow of the USS New Orleans. Yeah, so the idea with the theory going here is that the USS New Orleans wasn't sunk, the bow was just blown off, um, and then they steamed back to the US backwards, uh, literally in reverse across the Pacific. Okay, on the right fluke, there might be some writing, so we'll want to try to zoom in on that. It looks directly in front of us, I think I can see oh, some. Oh yeah. It's an A on the right. We're all like see turning it. our heads. Uh -huh. 10 in the bottom center. Yeah, that's right. good. Uh, it looks like there's several lines of text. Yeah. Okay, I have the orientation. It's upside down, but look at the middle line. It says Navy Yard. I agree. Yeah. Wow. So, Frank, tell us what we learned. Well, uh, we had an interesting end of watch at, uh, from the midnight to four watch last night. We were looking, heading to uh, sites that had been identified by the Drix. When we looked at it, as I went off watch, we were speculating whether we had possibly found the bow structure that had been lost from the USS New Orleans during the Battle of Tassafaraga. And we found a couple of pieces, uh, in particular, the way the anchor was situated in the wreckage also appeared to match up with that image of the, the New Orleans uh, pre-war. And then we saw, found a picture of her in dry dock, a frontal picture, bow on, and there was kind of a distinct little indentation in the, in the forward part of the, uh, the ship. And we pulled that image of the wreckage and that side by side with the image of the ship in dry dock and it clearly matched. At this point, I feel we are definitely looking at the mains of the bow uh, that were lost at, um, from the New Orleans during that battle. Oh, oh, can we go look at the giant sponge? Oh, God, what? Wow. Can we take a little fly by that? That oh, is much. crazy. All right, I told you that. the preview looks good. Yeah, but this looks like, whoa, like what? <laughs> monuments oh. seem to have these really massive sponges. Look they at sure that. do. That's ah. why they're monuments.
<laughs> that looks good. I want to bite it. <laughs> we're just going to keep finding bigger ones and bigger ones, and we're going to get more and more impressed. And what kind of roles do sponges play in the environment? Is it similar to coral? or They're very much like corals. They add additional structure to the seafloor, provide habitat for a number of different animals. Do sponges have like a particular lifespan or external factors cause them to um, like this? Well, we can't really age sponges, so oh. we don't know how long they live uh, per se, but most every animal has a lifespan and these ones obviously do. <gasps> it's a chimera. Whoa. Oh, oh, yeah. Million percent. Here, here oh, back. my so, God. Oh, my goodness. Whoa. That's getting at five Where on my did highlight. This come from? Yeah, this is, this is uh, really cool. Oh, my gosh. It's interested in us. It's very yeah, interested in us. Coming in hot. Wow. Hi. But this is I a big one. I can kind of see it, actually. This, this wow. Is He's oh, big. my gosh. This is a big chimera, right? Oh, how Jurassic this looks, doesn't it? Nice. Wow. So Dramatic, dramatic shot. shot. Of it. Yeah. <laughs> that is incredible. What is this? Oh, what is it? My little friend saying hello. So the what's this that we're looking at? Hello, is hello. Uh, sea spider? Sea spider, Ooh. yeah. How cool, look at that. Ooh. Oh, it's such a tiny little body. It's so much leg. So yeah. much leg. <laughs> they they are pretty much all leg. <laughs> all their essential things are in the legs. What? That's yeah. right. I was just reading about that the okay, other day. What do you mean the essential things? Like, yeah, like, like everything? Their guts are in their legs. Yeah. yeah. What? Exactly. That is so cool. Yeah, I learned there's something new again today. Oh my yeah, gosh. There's just not much carapace and the guts have to go somewhere. And they have um, sort of these light sensing organs. You can see that on the top of the head, those little glowing dots. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, there's the coral response. You just saw the polyps start to retract. Yep. Oh, they were like, Ugh, get off me. <laughs> it's always kind of neat when you get to see a sea spider. We don't get to see them yeah. particularly often. Do they get any bigger than that? Yeah, well, there's the colosenides. Yeah. Get to be like 30 to 40 centimeters. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It's kind of getting into nope territory. <laughs> Uh, there's another Iridogorgia, yeah. as you can see right here. Beautiful. And then a bunch of other coral. Maybe we can look at this one here. Yeah. They're beautiful. It's, wow. yeah, that, that's amazing. That's <laughs> not something you see every day. <laughs> we might see it every day here. <laughs> this, this would yeah, make that's a the case, I hope so. That's it's super beautiful. beautiful coral. And this can get like really large sometimes. And correct me if I'm wrong, these are also known as firework coral, so is that correct? On the ground. I actually do not know their common name, so it's possible. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it, it would make sense to me. So pretty. So pretty. Do you know why they have that crazy spiral shape? Yeah, I'm not sure what, why that shape. They're often very flexible. Uh, so if you have a lot of current, they actually bend a lot. So you usually don't find them in, a, in crazy current necessarily. Uh, but I'm sure that spirally shape probably has some kind of advantage, I would say related to hydrodynamics probably. Um, maybe that creates some kind of like micro turbulence also and that uh, helps uh, maybe gathering food near the polyps. So a lot of corals, their shape depends on the currents and are adapted so that they optimize currents and micro hydrodynamic at the centimeter scale so they can optimize food capture. That makes sense.